hello everybody. Uh, my name's Claire. I'm joined by Dr. Charlie Gardner from XR Scientists. We're here to film just a follow-up to the last video that we made about what the IPCC reports actually really mean. They're often written in this sort of dreadfully technical language. They're quite hard to understand and at the moment they're being completely overshadowed by other news. It's really distressed today to see one front page with it mentioned in the British newspaper sort of landscape. So we're going to try and like unpack a whole load of stuff that's in the reports. I guess I want to open by just saying what I think is like the frame for what this report is actually saying because they come in sort of instalments if you like. It's the mitigation paper so it's been very difficult to negotiate. It's about how you actually do the things that we need to do whereas the last paper was much more about how awful the consequences of inaction are looking likely to be. And I'd say that one of the main things about what this paper is saying is that 1.5 degrees is very, very, very unlikely now. There is a beginning of a conversation about overshoot, which is that you just breach 1.5 and somehow go back in time. We'll talk about that as well. There's a lot of stuff on technology reliance. I would say the main takeaways, spoiler alert, is that we've been massively lied to and that we've all been bullshitting ourselves uh, and the wrong people are in charge. So, Charlie, let's go to the first points. We've like highlighted bits. I'm going to ask you what you think this means. First point is like in part of the introduction, it says, increasing diversity of actors and approaches to mitigation. Recent literature highlights the growing role of non-state and sub-national actors, including cities, businesses, indigenous peoples, citizens, including local communities and youth, transnational initiatives and public-private entities in the global effort to address climate change. But obviously, they should have put Extinction Rebellion on that list, but Absolutely. what are they saying? So this is saying that the problem is so big that we really need everyone to be involved. We cannot just leave it to our governments, particularly because our governments have such a poor track record and they are failing. So. We tend to have this dichotomy in the climate movement. We talk about the need for either individual lifestyle change or system change. What this is saying is that while you know, it's not enough to just try to change the government and try to change ourselves, every institution needs to change and every different type of um, stakeholder in society, different groups of people need to be involved in this process. Cool. It says here from 1850 to 2019 were, and then there's some big numbers, <laughs> but I'm just going to go on the percentages. Of these, more than half, 58%, occurred between 1850 and 1989, uh, and about 42% between 1990 and 2019, which sounds like a hell of a lot, and about 17% of historical cumulative net CO2 emissions since 1850 occurred between 2010 and 2019. What does that actually mean? So they've used 1850 as a starting point then because this was about the time of the Industrial Revolution and they're saying of the total carbon emissions we've ever emitted since 1850, 42% of that, so nearly half, has been since 1989. You know, I was already 10 years old in 1989. This is nearly half our emissions just in the last 33 years. And this is really worrying because we knew all about climate change already by 1989. In 1992, governments of the world met and agreed to start decarbonizing. They agreed to start this process a long, long time ago. But yet, the words, the agreements have clearly meant nothing because you know, we've emitted almost as much since 1989 in full knowledge of what the impacts of that would be as we ever did in ignorance beforehand. So just knowing about the problem and talking about the problem hasn't actually stopped the problem. What was really worrying there is 17% of all our emissions since 1850 have been just since 2010. In the nine years from 2010 to 2019, we emitted nearly a fifth of everything. That's an extraordinary amount of growth in emissions we're having in, in recent years. And yet the trend is absolutely in the wrong direction. In 1992, governments met and agreed to slam on the brakes. We still 
haven't taken our foot off the accelerator, let alone um, slammed on the brakes. And so it just shows how this whole you know, intergovernmental process since 1992 has been a failure. It hasn't worked. Mm. Yeah, and then this, this follows on from that perfectly. So emissions reductions in CO2 from fossil fuels and industrial process due to improvements in energy intensity of GDP and carbon intensity of energy have been less than emissions increases from rising global activity levels in industry, energy supply, transport, agriculture and buildings. And you were just mentioning, whilst we were looking over these notes, that the word degrowth is in the main report, but not this uh, summary for policymakers. Yeah, so that's really important to note that this isn't the full report that we're looking at here. This is a, a synthesis of it, a very brief summary. So the full report is several thousand pages, um, and that is developed by scientists. This summary for policymakers is agreed by the governments of the world. So obviously condensing a report of several thousand pages into a report of 64 pages means a lot of stuff gets left out. And it's not scientists that are deciding what makes it into the final report. Politicians are involved as well. So degrowth is about um, changing our economic system so we're not focused on continual economic growth but instead we contract our economy in a planned way and this can be done without negative impacts. The fact that it, that word appears 26 times in the full report but never in the summary for policymakers is really telling and it should appear in this section here because what they're saying is that we've made big advances in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of how much economic value we can extract from a certain amount of, of, of energy. But despite all those advances, energy um, use is still growing because we're finding more and more ways to use energy. We're just using much, much more of it. So all these advances in, in efficiency and things, they count for nothing if we're finding new needs for energy. And so the result is, our emissions are growing and growing and growing because our economy is growing and growing and growing. Efficiency alone will never be able to change that. We need to stop economic growth. And it's quite concerning that that, has, that, that message hasn't made it into this final version of the report, um, thanks to political influence. And it's also true, isn't it, that there's like a really uh, old, very, very well-known sort of phenomenon in economics called the efficiency paradox which was understood in the 1800s that that's true yes when you when you become more efficient you don't stop producing you use those gains to produce more mm. for example if you um, developed a way to become much much more efficient in your work so that you managed to get all your work done by monday you wouldn't take the rest of the week off you do more work yeah. And this is the same thing we see in our industrial processes. We find ways to become more energy efficient, but rather than using less energy, we just use our energy efficiency to do more work with the energy we have. So overall, um, energy use continues to grow despite the efficiency. It's like in sustainable fashion, I often talk about it. It's like, it feels like the backbone of sustainability discussions. Let's make things more efficient. And then when you look at it and it seems like it's making it worse, you think, Oh, <laughs> maybe we're asking the wrong questions. I think a simple rule of thumb is that <clears throat> if efficiency permits you to grow more, then that's not good efficiency. If efficiency allows you to contract, then that's good efficiency. Mm. This one I nearly left out, but we're going we're gonna to speak to it because it's, there's something interesting. Um, and it's been in some of the headlines, people like reporting on this, because it sounds positive, I think. At least 18 countries have sustained greenhouse gas emissions reductions for longer than 10 years. You just told me that includes the UK. So yes, yeah, so it, it sounds good news, doesn't it? I mean, 18 countries are reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. Well, you know, that, that's less than 10% of, of countries in the world, so that's not enough. Um, but also, t to me, this is a bit of a 
an accounting trick. It depends on which emissions you count. So the UK is on this list. It says the UK has declined our emissions, uh, decreased our emissions over the last couple of decades. And in some respects, we have. You know, we're using a lot less coal to generate our electricity mm -hmm. than we did in the past. And that is a real emissions reduction. But actually, these figures don't include all our emissions. So they don't include emissions from flying and shipping. And they don't include um, the emissions from things we consume but don't produce ourselves. This has been a big reason of our decline in our emissions is that we don't produce stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we, we get other people to, to produce it for us and then we buy it. You know, you hear people say, well, what about China? China's got you know, massive emissions. Well, it does, but those emissions are coming partly from producing stuff that we buy. So I don't think they should even count as China's emissions. They should be our emissions. And when you add those emissions back onto our national accounting, any reductions we've made look much, much less impressive. The next bit is LDCs have contributed less than 0.4% of historical cumulative emissions between 1850 and 2019. And um, I'll let you explain, but my side note just says the word fuck. So LDCs are the least developed countries. These are the poorest countries in the world. And there are 40, I think there are 46 of them. So these 46 countries, you know, that's nearly a quarter of all countries have contributed less than half a percent to all our emissions um, you know, going back all the way to 1850. The next sentence in that report refers to SIDS, small island developing states, which have contributed 0.4 percent of, of, of global emissions. So together, the, the least developed countries and the small island developing states, that's like 84 countries that between them have emitted less than 1% of it. And this is really important to understand because it means not everyone is to blame. People in industrialized nations, um, our nations have contributed much, much more. You know, we've, we've been emitting since 1850 because um, we were at the very start of this process. So our historical contribution to the problem in the UK is, is huge and yet 84 countries around the world have contributed less than 1%. So that already, you know, smacks of injustice. It's even worse when we consider how vulnerable those countries are. So the small island developing states that have contributed only 0.4% of the problem, they're the most vulnerable to, to, of all. Mm. They're going to be paying the costs. These are islands which are going to disappear. Those, those island states simply are not going to exist anymore. There is no bigger cost to pay than the end of your existence. And it's just an extraordinarily unfair situation that those yeah. that have done the least to contribute to it are having to pay for it with their entire existence. It's just, it's tragic. Yeah, it's extreme, isn't it? And, and then this is, feels like a, a positive point, but I, it ties to the other one, but it, it, it worries me that it might not be um, taken seriously, to be honest, but it says eradicating extreme poverty, energy po poverty, and providing decent living standards to all those in regions in the context of achieving sustainable development objectives in the near term can be achieved without significant global emissions growth. Tackling climate crisis basically doesn't have to mean that you can't help people out of poverty in the world, right? So that's what it's Yeah, exactly. Saying. And this is really important because, you know, we have multiple global priorities. It's not just climate change we're addressing here. We do need to eradicate poverty. We do need to end inequality. And we do need to ensure that everybody around the world, no matter where they live, has, you know, access to education and, and all these important things. Now, some people um, have argued in the past that one of the problems with decarbonizing is that it'll mean that poor countries can't develop. Yes. And of course, nobody is saying that. Nobody is saying it's poor countries that, that have to pay the cost for this. You know, we're all saying it's rich countries that should pay the cost for this. But here, the IPCC are being explicit. Decarbonization does not have to have any impact on our ability to reduce poverty around the world. We can do both without a problem. So that's good news. That is good news.
Yeah, uh, if they do it. Well. Um, so uh, there's more on finance flow and stuff later. But um, globally, ten the 10% of households with the highest per capita emissions contribute 34 to 45% of global consumption-based household greenhouse gas emissions, while the middle 40% contribute 40 to 53%, and the bottom 50% contribute 13 to 15%. So this is really important because it points to how it's not humanity that is driving climate uh, carbon emissions, it's economic consumption, it's yeah. wealth. And essentially rich people on, on, on a global level are much greater contributors to the problem through our own individual carbon footprints than poor people. So it talks about the top 10% um, richest households in the world well you know if you're watching this on a, a laptop or a phone and you're in an industrialized country like the UK then that's you you're all in the top 10% richest globally and yeah, the poorest half of the world only contribute 13 percent of the problem and this is really important to recognize because you often hear people say the problem is overpopulation. There are just too many people. Well, what this data shows is that that's not true. The problem is overconsumption by the rich 10% of the world. It's not that there are too many people. It's not um, poor Africans that are the problem. It's our societies right here. Mm -hmm. There is a point here which feels like it shouldn't be rocket science. It says there's been a consistent expansion of policies and laws addressing mitigation since AR5. This has led to the avoidance of emissions that would otherwise have occurred and increased investment in low greenhouse gas technologies and infrastructure. It feels like it should say, like, write laws, stupid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, they work. AR5 is the previous um, assessment report that IPCC published um, several years ago. We're here discussing AR6. And so what they said there is, is, is yeah, like, like you said, you know, we have implemented laws since the previous report and they have worked. We've emitted less you know, greenhouse gases than we would have if we hadn't taken action. So the, the take home here is that this stuff does work. When we take action, it can have an impact. We're just not doing nearly enough of it, nearly fast enough. This is encouraging. The actions that have taken place globally since several years ago have had a small impact. So mm -hmm. that's positive. It's just the impact is not nearly big enough. Yeah. Global greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 associated with the implementation of nationally determined contributions, NDCs, announced prior to COP26, footnote 24, would make it likely, in italics, that warming will exceed 1.5 during the 21st century. And then it says, likely limiting warming to below two degrees would then rely on a rapid acceleration of mitigation efforts after 2030. My side notes is political bollocks, question mark. Political bollocks, <laughs> indeed. I, I, that's a nice way to, to summarise it. So the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, are what each country has pledged to do within the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement sets this overall goal of trying to stay within 1.5, but it lets individual countries determine what they're all going to do. So what they're saying there is that if we add up all the pledges, all the NDCs that every country has made, we're going to blow past 1.5. Even the, the, the promises that the countries are making aren't sufficient. The pledges aren't strong enough. And yet, of course, we know that those pledges are just words. You yeah. know, they're not um, translated into policies. So take the UK, for example. UK has a decarbonisation target for 2050. Um, we have made our NDCs, so we're saying the right things. But when we look at the government's actual policies, they're not putting in place policies that will allow us to meet our pledges. So just in the last year in the UK, for example, we've seen approval of a new coal mine in Cumbria, expansion of a coal mine in Wales, six new oil and gas fields in the North Sea, £27 billion road building programme, um, expansion of airports, all these policies, the actual policies that the government are implementing are taking us in the wrong direction. They're saying, yes, 
here is our national, nationally determined contribution, this is what we will achieve, but they're not putting in place policies to allow them to achieve that. And then, even if, they, even if each country was able to meet its NDC, that still wouldn't be enough because yeah. that won't take us to 1.5. It's politics getting in the way of what needs to be done. Kevin Anderson, of the, um, you know, one of the, the, the most high profile climate scientists in the UK and, and indeed the world, he says, you know, there are two separate planets. There is the real world <laughs> in which you know, science and the rest of us live, and there is this other world that the politicians <laughs> exist within. And there's just no connection between them. And this is really, really serious because this is not a game of politics. This is mm. about our planetary system and you just cannot negotiate with physics. Okay, policies implemented by the end of 2020 are projected to result in higher global greenhouse gas emissions than those implied by NDCs, indicating an implementation gap. What a phrase, implementation gap, that hides a multitude of sins. So this is what I was saying before, how th this implementation gap means countries have said um, they've set targets, but they're not actually done anything to meet them. They're not putting in place the policies. So, and, and this implementation gap, it's like, it's, it's like an excuse, isn't it? Imagine if we all did that at work or with our homework at school. And like, no, sorry, there's an implementation gap. I said I'd do it, but I just didn't do it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's really weird language. I don't know what would make you use language like that. Um, projected cumulative future CO2 emissions over the lifetime of existing and currently planned fossil fuel infrastructure without additional abatement exceed the total cumulative net CO2 emissions in pathways that limit warming to 1.5 degrees, more than 50%, with no or limited overshoot. They are approximately equal to total cumulative net CO2 emissions in pathways that limit warming, warming to 2 degrees. It's just a bit of a salad, isn't it? It is How a bit of a salad, but the, the message saying. is actually quite simple. It's saying if we carry on using our existing fossil fuel infrastructure and our planned fossil fuel infrastructure yeah. until the end of its life, we will blow past two degrees. In other words, we have to shut down fossil fuel infrastructure and we certainly should not be investing in any more of it. International Energy Agency have said it too. It's, you know, yeah. this is not news. Everybody knows we can have no more new fossil fuels. Yeah. Global greenhouse gas emissions are projected to peak between 2020 and at the latest before 2025 in a global model pathway that limit warming to 1.5 degrees with 50% or more than 50%. Just to say, I got a message from somebody recently, just earlier today I think, saying that previously this kind of report was saying uh, emissions must peak in 2020 and then begin to come down in order for us to have any chance of da 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 da. So it, I'm going to double check that, but if that is correct, is there a chance that this is just people going, oh shit, let's add five years? Because it seems like we can only ever work in like, we'll do this in 100 years, we'll do this in 50 years, we'll do this in five years, no, give us another five years, give us another 10 years. I think that's, you know, your interpretation is right. This is a shifting of the language. As we blow past our previous targets, we simply set new targets. And we see this um, at a higher level too, with talk about 1.5 and 2 degrees. When we started um, international climate negotiations in the 90s, you know, 1.5 degrees was the absolute target that we must not hit, we must not reach 1.5. Now it's, it's shifted from being a must avoid uh, limit to a, I really hope we can reach this limit and, and soon it'll just be a forgotten limit. So we see this shifting of language and it's dangerous. Yeah, and just to say, like the heartbreaking thing about it is also that if you get yourself step out of this weird IPCC like report language world, you can easily remember if you've been paying attention to the space that nobody even thought 1.5 was safe anyway right no. so it's a it's everyone's going oh no cry for 1.5 but actually it was you know that's a guaranteed like disaster for a lot of people we're at 1.2 already and people are dying all over yeah. the world clearly yeah. 1.5 is not safe we're up to c 2.3 oh nearly there <laughs> um 
uh, in modelled global low emission pathways, the projected reduction of cooling and warming aerosol emissions over time leads to net warming in the near to mid term. When I said I wanted to include this, you said, oh, it's difficult though, because I don't know everything about it. But I, my understanding is everyone doesn't know everything about it. But also that's why no one talks about it. So do you want to explain what it is? So this is one of the big areas of uncertainty in climate science. When we burn fossil fuels, we're not just releasing greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide uh, and the rest of it. We're also releasing particulates, like aerosols, so you know, little bits of soot and stuff in smoke. And it turns out these aerosols have a cooling effect because they reflect solar energy back into space. So when we're burning fossil fuels or burning wood, we're doing two things. We're emitting greenhouse gases that heat and aerosols that cool. So the, there's a risk that as we rapidly decarbonize, if we hugely reduce the aerosols in the atmosphere, there's a risk that even though decarbonization will keep us cool in the long term, we might get hotter in the short term because of the loss of aerosols. And it, it's a big worry. There's a lot of argument, my understanding about could be very high impact, could be a lower impact, we're not really sure. And that's why it sort of often gets left out of the conversation, yeah. right? Because we don't have much data. Exactly. And this report does not clarify, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so all global model pathways that limit warming to 1.5 with no or limited overshoot and those that limit warming to 2 involve rapid and deep and in most cases immediate greenhouse gas emission reductions in all sectors. This is what everybody knows, that if we're to have any hope of, of keeping within these heating limits, we need to hugely decarbonize rapidly and completely in every sector of the economy. Mm. And then there's like a bit of a bollocks section underneath it. Doing less in one sector needs to be compensated by further reductions in other sectors. If warming is to be limited, uh, my side note says WTF. Um, in modelled pathways that limit warming to 1.5, with no or limited overshoot, the global use of coal, oil and gas in 2050 is projected to decline with median values of 95, about 95%, 60% and 45% compared to 2019. See, I was really shocked when I read this this morning. It's saying um, that you know, we need to reduce oil production by 60% by 2050 and gas production by 45% by 2050. These are really, really low numbers. You know, if we were aiming for true decarbonization, true zero rather than net zero, those numbers would all have to be 100%. 100% no coal, 100% no oil, 100% no gas. <laughs> Here the IPCC is saying we only have to reduce oil production by 60%. And to me, that is putting a hell of a lot of faith in carbon dioxide removal technologies. Yeah. So when we talk about net zero, what that means is um, balancing how much we put into the atmosphere with how much we take out. Now the easiest way to reach net zero, the simplest way, is to not put anything up there because then you don't need to take anything out. Um, what this is saying is that we only need to reduce oil by 60%, carry on emitting loads from oil and gas, but that means we're going to have to invest massively in technologies to suck that, that yeah. carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and those technologies don't exist yet, as we'll talk about later. So it's a huge risk to be taking. Well, yeah, and then it's got the use of coal, oil and gas without CCS in model pathways, uh, that limit warming to 1.5 with no or limited overshoot is projected to be reduced to a greater degree with medium values. Blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, what they're saying is, yes, we are going to have this technology, right? I mean, isn't it what we used to call it, like unicorn tech? That, that's been like, policies have been written on it, like negotiations have taken place with an assumption that this is going to happen, but it basically was made up. At the time of Paris, people didn't know whether they could ever make it really work or scale. It's not a realistic solution and, and some of the versions of it are more carbon intensive to produce than what they draw down. So why is this paper full of it? <laughs> because, because even though it doesn't work, the idea that it might work 
provides a very convenient excuse for not taking action now. Mm -hmm. um, if we have this magical way to suck carbon out of the atmosphere in the future, then surely that means it's okay to carry on emitting now. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a popular um, proposed solution because it sounds great. It means we don't have to do the difficult things now. But a popular solution is no good if it doesn't actually work. And so in fact, it's really dangerous because it's used as an excuse to carry on emitting when what we need is emissions cuts immediately. And when you think about this idea of carbon capture and storage, it really doesn't make sense. So the problem is that we're taking fossil carbon from deep in underground and we're extracting it, we're burning it, and that's causing climate change. What they're proposing here with carbon capture and storage is we take out the carbon, we burn it, then we capture the gases, solidify it back into carbon and put it back under the ground. Why don't we just leave it in the ground in the first place? The other method just doesn't make any sense. We have other ways to generate energy now. Mm. Uh, the energy sector requires major transitions, including a substantial reduction in overall fossil fuel use, the deployment of low emission energy sources, switching to alternative energy carriers, and energy efficiency and conservation. The continued installation of unabated fossil fuels infrastructure will lock in greenhouse gas emissions. So again, that word unabated, is that only there to say you can still do fossil fuels so long as you put carbon capture on it? It's a get out of jail free card. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But a magical get out of jail free card. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. This is good. This is a good bit, I like this bit. Limiting global warming to two degrees or below will leave a substantial amount of fossil fuels unburned and could strand considerable fossil fuel infrastructure. Then it says, depending on its availability, CCS could allow fossil fuels to be used longer, reducing stranded assets. So this is like basically a load of waffle to protect stranded assets, right? Yeah, huge amounts of money is invested in fossil fuels and fossil fuel infrastructure but those fossil fuels have to be left in the ground if we're going to get out of this alive so that means it's a bad investment you're not going to get your money back on your investment because we have to shut down fossil fuels we're not going to be allowed to burn them you're going to lose your money so when we think about how much money i think it mentions up to four trillion dollars there um, yeah when we think about how much money is tied up in this fossil fuel infrastructure and saving the world from climate change means that money can't be recouped, then we start to understand why we're not seeing any action. Because the richest, most powerful um, sectors, you know, people in, in, in our global societies, they have some of their money invested in fossil fuels and they don't want to lose their money. So they are choosing the destruction of life on earth they are choosing genocide so they can protect their money it's it's just the most incredible just wrong that you you, you can imagine it is deeply deeply disturbing mm. and that's the other thing about this paper being separated from the last one isn't it that you can look at this and it's really dry it's all about policy it's all really technical whereas the last paper I felt at least, if you read into it, you could understand this has like grave humanitarian implications. Secretary General said this is an atlas of human suffering. This isn't an atlas of human suffering, is it? This is an atlas of confusing, technical, it, it really is. boring stuff. Yeah, I, th I think the way to interpret um, this is that at the end of every paragraph, you have to imagine there's a little asterisk that says, if we don't do this, everything ends. Mm. That's the context here. Yeah. In model global scenarios, existing buildings, if retrofitted, and buildings yet to be built are projected to approach net zero g greenhouse gas emissions in 2050, if policy packages which combine ambitious sufficiency, which is a good word, we don't hear that enough, do we? Sufficiency, efficiency, and renewable energy measures are effectively implemented and barriers to decarbonisation are removed. This is like 
big up to you, Insulate Britain, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's saying that our houses are a big part of, of the problem. They, they leak energy. And, and the answer to that is for, for the houses we already have, we need to insulate them exactly as Insulate Britain said. And we need to do that for the poorest people in society first. But what's really crazy to me is that we have the technology to build zero carbon houses, right? And yet in this country, we're still building tens of thousands of new houses that are going to have to be immediately retrofitted. It's going to be hugely expensive. Why don't we just change the rules now, change the standards so that all new houses we're building are zero carbon houses? There are some yeah. really easy things that we can do here, but our governments are not doing that. Someone who, who um, is close to the IPCC process and like knows the authors and stuff said to me, this is the first paper that's going to actually say cut demand in order to cut emissions, which just feels like, I, I don't know how it takes 27 years to cut. Yes, we should have been like saying Like the that fact that you actually cut emissions. But this, this is where they're saying uh, something demand focused. Interventions can reduce demand for all transport services and support the shift towards more energy efficient transport modes. It's basically like saying, if we can make it nicer for people to walk on the cycle and get out of private cars and all of that, then you can just reduce the demand on the transport sector, Absolutely. right? I mean, it's just not, I don't understand how is any of this like, ge like genius, genius stuff to work out. Lots of people have been saying this for a long time. And of course, like many other climate solutions, getting cars out of cities has lots of other benefits. It's good for human health. It's good for our mental health if we walk in cycle places. There are big win-win-wins to be had everywhere. Housing and transport are good examples of that. but. It's, it won't happen if we leave it up to individuals to implement these changes. We need structural changes at the yeah. government level to make it attractive to not use private cars. Okay, so then this section is on AFOLU mitigation options. That which is means a terrible acronym, isn't it? Agriculture, forestry and land use. It's the, the phrase they use to describe, to talk about everything about how we use the land. Mm -hmm. And it says here... When substantially implemented, mitigation options in this area can deliver large-scale greenhouse gas emission reductions and enhance removals, but cannot fully compensate for delayed action in other sectors, which is like completely contrary to what the previous paragraph said about how you could make gains in one sector, be a bit crap in another sector, and you could just balance them all out. This is them saying, no, like you can't balance them out with this... Yeah. It's a bit, I don't know, it feels very confused it, to it, me it, it is, in, in that way. It is slightly unclear, but the message here is a key one and a very important one. It says we need to protect nature and we need to restore nature. And that can be a big con contribution to the issue. However, it does not replace stopping burning fossil fuels. We need to do both of them at the same time. And this is really important because we see a lot these days companies, governments, everyone going, oh, it's all right, we planted some trees, like as if that's fixed everything. The IPCC are very clear, protecting nature is not an alternative to stopping fossil fuels. We need to do both. And then there's like risks, right, with land land yeah. solutions. So this is it. You know, we talk about how we can just reforest the world, plant a trillion trees and that will fix it. Where are we going to do that? You know, all the land that isn't already in forests or cities is being used to grow food or it's lands that indigenous people already live on. That's somebody else's land and they're already using it for something. Where are we going to put these fucking trillion trees without taking farmland out of food production? We don't have the space for it. Mm. It's not the answer. And then here, demand side mitigation encompasses changes in infrastructure use, end use technology adoption, and socio-cultural and behavioural change. There's some stuff in here, isn't there, also about like digital technology and how it can sort of help, but it can also make everything worse. There are lots of different pieces in <coughs> the puzzle here. Everything has to change. And yes, digital technologies and other technologies are part of the solution. But ultimately, nothing fundamentally changes the bottom line, which is stop burning stuff. Mm. This is my worst section of bullshit in the whole paper. I think upscaling 
the deployment of CDR depends on developing, which CDR is carbon dioxide removal, depends on developing effective approaches to address feasibility and sustainability constraints, especially <laughs> at large scale. So, like, we need to address feasibility of carbon dioxide removal, which means it's not feasible, right? Exactly. And yet this whole report is built around <laughs> this. You know, when, when we said, when they said earlier, we only need to reduce oil by 60%, that was based on the fact that we can, you know, use CDR to, to sort out the remaining 40%. But now they're saying CDR is not feasible. We need to overcome the feasibility constraints. I've never seen more weaselly language than yeah. overcome the feasibility constraints. Yeah. It doesn't work, is what they're saying. Okay, and then on to cost. So the global economic benefit of limiting warming to two degrees is reported to, to exceed the cost of mitigation in most of the assessed literature. So that's something we've all heard before, right? It's cheaper taking to action, do it. Taking than not do action it. is cheap. And so I don't even like this word cost because it's not a cost, it's an investment. It will get paid back multiple times over. And in fact, I don't even like the framing about you know, even talking about the finance of this, because when we say, oh, how, ex how expensive is it? We're tacitly saying, oh, can we afford it? Fuck that, it's not a choice. None of this stuff is optional. We have to do all of it or everything ends and we won't have life on this planet anymore. So who, who cares how expensive it is? We just gotta do it. Nevertheless, it is obviously encouraging that you know, this is a wise investment. It, it, it's, it will pay itself back. Tracked financial flows fall short of all levels needed to achieve mitigation goals across all sectors and regions. The challenge of closing gaps is largest in developing countries as a whole. Scaling up mitigation financial flows can be supported by clear policy choices and signals from governments and the international community. So part of the problem here is that we're not paying for what needs to be done. When it talks about global financial flows, it's how much we're investing in decarbonisation and it's just not happening. Yeah, and the paper's also saying that poorer countries just can't deploy innovation and all of that stuff in the same way, right? Because they need, they need the cash to do it. Absolutely. So that place puts extra emphasis on us in the wealthy countries, not just to support others in the transitions that they need to make, but to make our transition faster. Here we are making excuses for not acting, but we can afford to act. Other people can't afford to act. And so really we shouldn't be making excuses. We should be showing leadership. I would love this like analogy. Imagine if you're like in a building and the fire alarm goes off and nobody runs out of the building because the fire alarm's going. They only run out of the building if other people run out of the building. It's not the alarm that makes you do the behavior, it's the other people's behavior, right, that makes you do the behavior. So yeah. this is like an easy way to understand collective sort of global action problem. Okay, so this is staggeringly like stupid thing to read uh, considering the situation we're in. There is sufficient global capital and liquidity to close global investment gaps given the size and of the global financial system, but there are barriers to redirect capital to climate action, both within and outside the global financial sector. We can afford it. The, we are, this planet is rolling in money, right? There is so much capital around, but it's really unevenly distributed. Some people have money, some people don't. As a global society, we can easily afford to address climate change. The reason we're not is what it calls barriers. In other words, the people that have the money don't want to spend it on this you know, critical, urgent action that needs to be taken. Like a Pyrrhic victory, isn't it? That you basically like win out in this economic game, but you destroy the... The ground in the, what are you going to use your money on on a dead planet? What's the point of accumulating all this money when you know, the planet's going to be dead? You're not going to Mars, mate. Spend the money on saving this world we have. Come on. Maybe we should send some of them to Mars. Well. <laughs> and then lastly, international cooperation is a critical enabler for in achieving ambitious climate change mitigation goals. And then it says the UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement are all supporting rising levels of national ambition, one of my least favourite words in the climate space, ambition, 
and uh, encouraging development and implementation of climate policies, although gaps remain. So we need to all act together. Countries need to work on a coordinated basis. And yeah, this is, I mean, it's obvious, but it's fundamentally important. And we need to keep reminding ourselves of that because as climate change gets worse, there's going to be a temptation on some sides to retract to individualism and you know, countries will become more isolated and you know, just scrapping for the last bits of what's left. But that's absolutely not the path we should go down globally. We need to work together. Mm -hmm. Just to reframe the whole negotiating space as de-escalation, basically. You know, it's like when everyone's lives are at risk. I don't know how else you would f frame a conversation which isn't like a negotiation to try and get the best deal. It's a negotiation to try and save the most lives. Yeah. It's a to it feels like a different different type of political work but i guess you'd have to take out the fossil fuel lobbyists for that to happen that's a first step so with the release of this uh report there was also yesterday like a press conference antonio guterres made some quite extraordinary statements i don't think anyone could say it better he sounded like he was um sounded like he joined xr to me from what he was saying the jury has reached the verdict and it is damning this report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a litany of broken climate promises. It is a file of shame, cataloguing the empty pledges that put us firmly on track towards an unlivable world. We are on a fast track to climate disaster. Major cities underwater, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortages, the extinction of a million species of plants and animals. And this is not fiction or exaggeration. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. We are on a pathway to global warming of more than doubled 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris. Some government and business leaders are saying one thing but doing another. Simply put, they are lying. And the results will be catastrophic. This is a climate emergency. Climate scientists warn that we are already perilously close to tipping points that could lead to cascading and irreversible climate impacts. But high emitting governments and corporations are not just turning a blind eye. They are adding fuel to the flames. They are choking our planet based on their vested interests and historic investments in fossil fuels, when cheaper, renewable solutions provide green jobs, energy security, and greater price stability. We left COP26 in Glasgow with a naive optimism based on new promises and commitments. But the main problem, the enormous growing emissions gap, was all but ignored. And the science is clear. To keep the 1.5 degree limit agreed in Paris within reach, we need to clap global emissions by 45% this decade. But current climate pledges would mean a 14% increase in emissions. And most major emitters are not taking the steps needed to fulfill even these inadequate promises. Climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals. But the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is moral and economic madness. Such investments will soon be stranded assets, a blot on the landscape and a blight on investment portfolios. But it doesn't have to be this way. Today's report is focused on mitigation, cutting emissions. It sets out viable financially sound options in every sector that can keep the possibility of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees alive. First and foremost, we must triple the speed of the shift to renewable energy. And that means moving investments and subsidies from fossil fuels to renewables now. In most cases, renewables are already far cheaper. It means governments ending the funding of coal, not just abroad, but at home. And it means climate coalitions made out of developed countries, multilateral development banks, private financial institutions, and corporations with adequate technologies supporting major econo emerging economies in making this shift. It means protecting forests and ecosystems as powerful climate solutions. It means rapid progress in reducing methane emissions. 
and it means implementing the pledges made in Paris and Glasgow. Leaders must lead. But all of us can do our part. We owe a debt to young people, civil society, and indigenous communities for sounding the alarm and holding leaders accountable. We need to build on their work to create a grassroots movement that cannot be ignored. If you live in a big city, a rural area, or a small island state, if you invest in the stock market, if you care about justice and our children's future, I am appealing directly to you. Demand that renewable energy is introduced now at speed and at scale. Demand an end to coal-fired power. Demand an end to all fossil fuel subsidies. Today's report comes at a time of global turbulence. Inequalities are at unprecedented levels. The recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is scandalously uneven. Inflation is rising, and the war in Ukraine is causing food and energy prices to skyrocket. But increasing fossil fuel production will only make matters worse. Choices made by countries now will make or break the commitment to 1.5 degrees. A shift to renewables will mend our broken global energy mix and offer hope to millions of people suffering climate impacts today. Climate promises and plans must be turned into reality and action now. It's time to stop burning our planet and start investing in the abundant renewable energy all around us. So what an amazing thing to hear from the Secretary General of the United Nations. This is not an activist. This is one of the most important global leaders there is. And he is saying climate activists are right. Extinction Rebellion are right. And the governments, like the British government that are pursuing a fossil fuel agenda, they are the extremists. We're not the extremists here. And this is obviously it's hugely vindicating for, for us that have been doing this, but I hope it's really empowering for others that aren't yet involved in the climate movement. Respectable people, David Attenborough, Antonio Gutierrez, they are on our side, they know we're doing the right thing. And there's never been a more important time to become a climate activist, um, you know, one of these non-radical climate activists. Those of us that are in the, the climate movement, I think for most of us, it's been a really transformative experience. We are happier, healthier people now because we're doing something rather than sitting at home going, oh, fuck. Um, so join us.